Hi, I'm Stacey from From Caliber, and this week we're going to be looking at sustainable energy. A few months ago, I read to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, investors will need to allocate an additional 1.2 trillion pounds a year to renewable energy and other low carbon projects. That's a lot of money. Will the threat of climate change alone be enough to drive this energy transition, or are there other factors that could help? I asked some fund managers and some specialists their thoughts. Well, we think over the next 30 years, there's going to be five major factors that drive the energy transition. Firstly, we have population growth and GDP growth, so the world is going to become bigger and require more energy. We have climate change as an issue, the emission of carbon dioxide and overcoming that. We have urban population, and then we have energy security as well. So having renewable sources is inherently more secure than relying upon imports from, for example, OPEC countries. The fifth and most important factor really is economics, in that the new supply is becoming cheaper, it is becoming more economic, and that's the key driver the next 30 years. Well, I suppose it's, the, uh, it's, that, it's that meeting between the increasing demand for energy worldwide. Uh, we're seeing projections of 25% increases in demand over the next 20 years, meeting the harsh reality of climate change. How do we, how do we match those two off? New research shows that renewable energy sources provided more electricity to the UK homes and businesses than fossil fuels for the first time last year. Well, I think uh, people should start to appreciate the fact that renewable energy in the UK is now uh, economically feasible in its own right. So the fact is that it's now cost competitive um, versus other conventional forms of energy generation. Um, whereas I think people presume there's a, uh, it's a supported industry requiring uh, government, government support. support, exactly. Um, so I think we're, we're on this cusp where um, onshore wind, solar, for example, are now cost competitive in their own right. But which countries are ahead of the curve in terms of wind and solar farms? China's been the dominant market in solar for years. As an example, in 2020, Guinness Asset Management estimates there will be 137 gigawatts of installations globally, of which China will contribute about 40 gigawatts. But there is growth from other countries too, India, Poland, Turkey for example. Uh, we're, we're primed for growth, I think, without any question. So we're going from a market that was installing about 20 gigawatts per annum in 2010 to about 137 gigawatts in 2020. We think that goes to 250 gigawatts per annum and beyond sometime in the next 10 years, all driven, again, very much by economics. So if we look at the total installations that we've had in the solar market since its uh, infancy, uh, it's been around 500 gigawatts. Um, we expect to see over four times that being installed over the next 10 years. And to put that into context, that is equivalent to the world's current capacity of nuclear power generation. When it comes to wind, according to Jonathan, the newest turbines sit nearly as tall as the Eiffel Tower at 1,000 feet, meaning the diameter of the turbine's blades themselves are around 500 feet. This means offshore growth will be key. Uh, predominantly in Europe, looking at Germany, looking at Denmark, the UK, Norway, all these areas will have a lot more offshore wind supply in the coming years. Also, offshore wind supply generally happens stronger at night time and is at a different time to onshore wind, so it actually helps in terms of balancing the power generation in the power stack. Solar panels, however, aren't as easy to move offshore, although BP does have some plans to build floating power cells but only time will tell. It's more likely that we'll see panels on top of factories, businesses, even our homes. Stuart Springham of TM Home Investor is looking at just that. Um, also going forwards within the fund, we're trialing um, an experiment at the minute where we're gonna take some homes within a cluster, say we own 10 homes, We'll take four of them and we'll, we'll put in solar panels or we'll put in air, air source or ground source heat pumps to try and see how that impacts on, on the energy bills of our tenants and also whether that impacts on the length they stay. We're unsure now whether that'll impact on the rent we could achieve, but I think going forward, it is all about the sustainability, the carbon footprint, and for us, keeping the tenants in, in the property longer if their energy bills are lower. 
I 100% support lower energy bills, but one of the problems with solar power and even wind is its consistency. If only we could be guaranteed 12 hours of sunshine in the UK a day. Instead, we tend to get the peak of solar in the middle of the day when the sun is its strongest, but when our electricity demand is probably at its lowest. Wind is more stable over the day, but still we can have very still days in February, for example. Although Storm Dennis would probably prompt a lot of you to disagree with me this year. More recently, we've seen a combination of wind, solar and storage technologies coming together to try and create what looks like a baseload stream of energy. This is basically trying to address the intermittency of renewables. We think about those companies associated with efficiency and the displacement of existing uh, energy demand. That is companies that are involved in making the world energy demand more efficient. If you believe the numbers of the IEA, world energy demand needs to be 40% more efficient by 2050 than it is today. So saving those barrels is just as important as generating the new kilowatts or kilowatt hours of renewable electricity. So as we've heard, sustainable energy, like most utilities, basically comes down to supply and demand. While demand is set to increase quite rapidly, the supply of wind and solar, because it's intermittent, presents a number of new challenges as well as opportunities. So it's not just about the wind and the solar farms themselves, there's a whole value chain of companies to consider. And then, of course, we look inside the wind turbine and inside the solar panel um, and you see materials like companies who make blades, companies who make glass for the solar panels. Um, you see in both um, significantly more copper content, significantly more semiconductor content, particularly power semiconductors, which are also something that, you know, you use almost eight times as many power semiconductors in an electric car. So as we look through the value chains of these sectors, we find potentially less recognized parts of the sector that are more interestingly valued, but also have a huge growth leverage um, to some of these decarbonization trends. Another challenge is how do we store this energy? And better still, how do we do it efficiently? We tackle this question in our next video in the series, building investments in sustainable energy using our homes and supermarkets.